morning, everyone. You're at the New York State Care Management Training Initiative webinar, and we'll be starting shortly. I see uh, the numbers going up as attendees are joining, so I'm just going to give a few um, more minutes because the numbers are, uh, are uh, flying up, so it's great to have you all here. So hang on another minute or two, and we will get started. Again, welcome to the New York State Care Management Training Initiative. I'm just going to wait one more minute before we get started because I still see many attendees joining and I just want to give us another uh, minute to jump in and then we will get started. We have a great presentation today. Okay, I think we'll get started. Again, welcome to everyone on the line, and there's quite a few of you, to the New York State Care Management Training Initiative. My name is Edie Schwartz, and I am the Director of Systems Transformation at NIAPRIS, and I'm standing in for Ruth Colon Wagner today, who is unable to be here. So I'm happy to be here to welcome you and give you a little bit of information housekeeping and then introduce our terrific speaker and, um, and field questions for today's webinar. So first, again, thanks to everybody for joining us. This has been such an exciting training initiative and um, I've been watching the webinars from behind and, um, and, uh, and looking at all of your progress and it's great to see it. So thanks again for joining us. I also want to take a minute to thank our partners who have crossed the top of your screen. We could not do this without the wonderful team that we have that works hard together to, um, to, to put these trainings together and make them relevant and, um, and make them something that you can really act on. So thanks very much to the New York State Council for Community Behavioral Health Care, the New York Care Coordination Program, the Center for Practice Innovation, the Coalition for Behavioral Health, and also um, to the place where our speaker for today comes from, the National Council for Behavioral Health. So it is, um, uh, it, it's great to have all of our partners work together and we're very happy to be a part of this coalition to offer you this training. So a couple pieces of housekeeping before I introduce Laura. There is a question box, you know this, you've kind of been through the drill. And uh, the question box is either on the right side or the bottom or the top of your screen. And, um, and put your questions in there because I will be fielding questions at the end of the presentation. Now put them in as you're thinking about them because it makes it easier for me to see. And also because, um, because if you're like me, you're gonna forget them as, as we move forward. So as soon as you think of your question, go ahead and put it right in and I'll read them at the Q&A <laughs> session. And then at the end, I'll let you know a little bit about what's coming up next, and, um, and we'll talk about that as well. So at this point, um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Laura Leone. And Laura, is that Leone or Leone, which I should have asked you before? It's okay, it's Laura Leone. Laura Leone, my, uh, my apologies. Laura Leone is currently, um, and would you change the slide, please, Laura? Um, okay. Oh, one second. I'm so sorry. Um, just take a peek at this slide. 
that um, that if you have any new registrations, that um, that supervisor should contact Ruth. And also, if you've missed a training, don't forget that they're all recorded and you can get them. And if you're watching as a group, please list everyone's name on the evaluation form. All right. And I actually can't see the bottom of that CEU slide, but I know that you have to go to all the trainings in order to get the social work CEUs. And you can certainly talk to Ruth about it if you're looking for CEUs. Next slide, Laura. Great. So, um, so now it's my pleasure to introduce Laura Leone, who is currently an integrated health consultant for the National Council. And uh, Laura provides training and consultation nationally on integrated care, mental health, substance use, evidence-based practice, practices and models. Um, and Laura has published extensively and presented for the National Council, for the American Association for Suicidology, for the New York Association for Play Therapy, and the Society for Social Work Leadership in Healthcare. Uh, Laura is um, in private practice, also works at an inpatient psychiatric hospital and in McLean Hospital's OCD Institute. So we are very pleased to have someone with such extensive experience and knowledge about integrated care here today to present. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Laura and say thanks so much for being with us today, Laura. And we look forward to listening. Thank you okay, so Laura. much, Edie, for that. Yeah, thank you, Edie, for that nice introduction. And good morning, everyone. And welcome to the webinar, Actionable Items to Help You Navigate Integrated Care. So just another reminder um, that you please do um, feel free to use the question box at any time to ask questions. And I'll make sure to leave time at the end to answer anything that comes up along the way. Um, also, I wanted to draw attention that the slide deck um, that I'm presenting today is a part of your GoToMeeting chat box, so you can actually click on that slide deck to download them for yourself, so please feel free to do so. So today, we are going to talk about your role as a member of the virtual team providing integrated care. And it's easy to think of yourself as outside or removed from the integrated practice. However, even though you are geographically outside roaming, roaming the streets of New York often, um, you are the eyes and ears in the community. You are the person who knows about the context that the person you are serving lives in. The majority of life that happens outside of the office for that person. In this webinar, we will talk about three areas where your knowledge and insight are critical to improving the health outcomes of the people that we serve. So if you see on the screen, and I do apologize, I'm not sure if everyone can see the bottom of, of the screen um, very clearly, so I apologize if that's cut off for other people. Um, but this slide here seems and appears so simple, but it describes a field that is very complex. So integrated care, integrated care looks very different in different settings. In many primary care clinics, there are now behavioral health staff who work right alongside the primary care providers. In other clinics, they are located in the same building, but the relationship is a little bit more distant. Many behavioral health providers around the country have primary care on site. Sometimes then the, the connections between primary care and behavioral health are close and there is a team approach. Other times it is more of a co-located approach. The point though is that the closer together primary care and behavioral health move towards each other, the more the people we serve will benefit. Understanding your role, whatever the close, closeness or distance of the practice is important. So defining integrated, integrated health. So I'm just gonna read you this quote. So at the simplest level, integrated behavioral and physical health care occurs when behavioral health, specialty, and primary care providers work together to address the physical and behavioral health needs of their patients. Integration can be bi-directional, either, either specialty behavioral health care introduced into primary care settings 
or primary health care introduced into specialty behavioral health settings. So this definition really speaks to the team approach to care and to the whole health approach to care. I like the quote of, we're putting the, the head back on the body of healthcare. So one of the driving forces behind integration is that when we tried to split people into body and mind, it didn't work. Physical and behavioral health issues occur in the same person at the same time. They are intimately connected to each other. And so when, as healthcare providers work together, people will get better. When we think about healthcare costs and healthcare outcomes, we don't always think about chronic health issues as the driver of costs. In fact, things that you see in people you serve every day are drivers of costs, of the need for care coordination and of the need for support and health behavior change. A chronic illness, which is a lot of what we see every day, can be defined as one where you are given a diagnosis, usually one or more prescriptions, and a sheet that tells you what to change when you, know, when you see your, your provider. That's often what happens the first time somebody gets diagnosed with a chronic illness. Chronic illnesses are things like high blood pressure, diabetes, arthritis, or heart disease. These illnesses are never solved with just a prescription though, and they require people to make adjustments in their lifestyle to impact their health outcomes. So as I mentioned a minute ago, chronic illness and behavioral health challenges often go hand in hand. This is true in diabetes, for example. Think about the challenges of managing changes in diet, monitoring blood sugar, exercise, stress. It's a lot for people. When you feel depressed, it's even more overwhelming. So support and problem solving can make a big, big difference. So as the slide before mentioned in this slide as well, you see that people with serious mental illness are dying 25 years earlier than the general population with an average age of death at 53 years old, which is so young. People um, with substance use disorders and person-centered healthcare home report noted that people with co-occurring mental health and substance use disorders are at the greatest risk with an average of death of 45. And these deaths and so many others are often due to preventable chronic illnesses that we really as a team are trying to help people manage. So right now we have a poll question just for the audience. So we'll pull that up for all of you. And I just want you to take a moment to think about what percentage of people that you are serving have at least one chronic health condition that you know of. And so go ahead and click into the box and just choose the answer and, and round to the, the closest answer that fits for what you know about the people you're serving. Okay, and if we could pull up those results. So we see here that 51% of you feel that 100% of the people you're serving have a chronic health condition. 41% 75, 9% 50, and 2% I don't know. And, you know, I think this slide is really about drawing attention to understanding that chronic illness is the number one healthcare problem in the United States. So likely, 50% or more of the people you serve have one or more chronic illnesses. And we can see very clearly from the slide that, that that's your, all of your impressions as well. And the, the I don't know, it's totally normal to not always know uh, information about, our, about the people that we serve, but it's certainly an area we do wanna focus on. So knowing who has a chronic illness 
from the people you serve will help you to help them and to connect them to the best care that they need. Okay, we can go to the next slide. There we go. So there are three strategies that I want to talk about to be a part of the virtual team. And strategy one is developing stronger primary care partnerships. So care coordination with physical health providers is an important piece of integrated care. And we really want to bridge that gap between what we all do or what a behavioral health provider does and what a primary care provider does. So for a long time in behavioral health, it was acceptable practice to just ask someone at intake whether they had a primary care provider. But those days are definitely in the past. We, we need to know so much more than just whether or not somebody has a primary care provider. Now we need to know who the provider is and when the person saw them last and whether that relationship is working or is helpful for the person, whether they are engaged in their own health care. And so we just have one other poll question for you now. And I want you to think about what percentage of the people you serve have seen their primary care provider in the past 12 months. And again, just give an estimate and round. Do you think they've seen 100% of, of your people that you serve have seen their PCP, 50 to 75, 25 to 50, or you're, you're not sure? Let me just go ahead and click into the slide and we'll give it one more moment. Okay, let's pull up those results. All right, and so we can see there's a little bit variance here in, in how much we feel that the people we serve are seeing their primary care provider. And so, again, most people we serve have a chronic, chronic illness. And if they haven't seen their primary care provider in the last 12 to 18 months, then there is a problem. Often people need to see their PCP much more frequently than that if they have a chronic illness. So it's helpful to know who from the people that you serve need assistance with making a connection to a PCP? And, and that's really what we're talking about um, as part of integrated care is working with your other teammates to really help the people you serve engage in all of the needs and services that are going to help them manage. We're moving on to the next slide. You know, Laura, as we go to the next slide, I just want to point out that, um, that it, you, first of all, I was looking at the poll results about how things have changed for us with so many people having chronic medical conditions. But I was a bit heartened to see that, um, that almost 80% ha have been in, in more recent contact with their PCPs. So um, your point is so well taken. Thank you, Edie, yeah. And so when sometimes when we're partnering with primary care, it can be challenging. Um, their culture is different than the culture of behavioral health. It's faster paced, driven by many protocols and insurance requirements. And some primary care practices are more open to serving people with behavioral health challenges than others. But it's important to know which practices the people you serve gravitate to, and then to make a concerted effort to partner with them and to partner with the other people in your team. So doing a direct outreach with some data about the number of people you share in common can make a big difference in getting, in getting them into the door. Meeting with an office manager, a nurse, can help you establish more regular communication. As with any relationship, it's always helpful to start with what they need rather than what you need. So thinking about how you can partner with, with your team is important and, and the people that you really want to have connect with the people you're serving.
So we want to help people also to prepare for their primary care visits. And you can help people write their questions down or consider if it would be helpful to accompany someone on their visit. And that can be especially helpful to someone who struggles with advocating for themselves or gets easily confused or forgetful. And so thinking about as, as you connect the people you serve with their primary care providers and engaging them in visits, consider how you might be able to help them in that process even further. And since, as we're discussing, chronic illnesses are a major issue for the people we serve, with strategy two, we're, we want to increase the health literacy for you and the people you serve. So this is really about your knowledge of common chronic conditions. And this is also another reason it's so important with partnering with primary care, because a good partner to both people we serve and to primary care involves increasing our knowledge about chronic illnesses. Health literacy isn't so that you take on the role of a doctor or a nurse or, or even work outside your scope, but it's about understanding information and language so that you can interpret for the people you serve what they are told and that you know when to ask for help from other healthcare pro providers when something isn't clear to you or isn't clear to them. So cardiovascular disease or hypertension. Um, there are some basic things you need to know about hypertension. It's a common illness. It can kill people. And as this last bullet says, even for people who have insurance, it isn't always managed well. Adherence to treatment is a challenge whether or not you have a behavioral health challenge. Knowing some basic things about common chronic illnesses will provide you with health literacy so that you can assist others. You will need to know and answer general questions and be able to help people manage in their life. And I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here because I'm sure this is something that's been happening for all of you already. It's helpful to understand um, in hypertension what, what the numbers and blood pressure mean. So the top number, is pressure in the blood vessels when the heart contracts. The bottom number is the remaining pressure during the time between heartbeats. So when we say uh, someone who has a healthy, healthy heart rate, that's typically 120 over 80. So 120 are the blood vessels when they contract that pressure. And then when the heart in between the beats, is that would be the number for 80, which is the pressure in between. And what happens in the body when the blood pressure is chronically high is that at some point, the muscle of the heart gets tired. That is the long-term impact of uncontrolled hypertension. And here are some examples of how we can help people with high blood pressure make different choices. We do this through our knowledge and skill in the evidence-based practice of motivational interviewing. So we can help people set small change goals and provide support and education. And this particular slide, um, which came from Million Hearts, is one of the many references um, in your slide deck at the end um, on the reference page so that you can um, look through more information at your leisure about hypertension and the other chronic illnesses discussed. So moving on to diabetes. So a second chronic illness is diabetes. As you can see here, diabetes is a major driver of costs in the healthcare system. And it's a chronic disease that impacts every part of somebody's life. And it's very complex to manage. Your body changes most of the food you eat into glucose, which is a form of sugar. And insulin is a hormone, hormone produced by the pancreas that allows glucose to enter all of the cells of your body and be used as energy. It's part of what we need to function. So when you have diabetes, the sugar builds up in your bloodstream instead of moving into the cells. Too much sugar in the blood can lead to very serious problems, including heart disease, damage to the blood vessels, and damage to the nerves and kidney. 
And there are two types of diabetes. So type one diabetes is an autoimmune disorder that occurs when the body stops making any insulin. In type two diabetes, the body either doesn't produce enough insulin or the cells ignore the insulin. And so between 90 to 95% of people who are diagnosed with diabetes have type two diabetes. There are many risk factors associated with diabetes. So you're at risk for diabetes, especially type two diabetes, if you're older than 45 years of age, if you're overweight, if you don't exercise regularly, your parent, brother, or sister has diabetes, you gave birth to a baby that weighed more than nine pounds, or you had gestational diabetes when you were pregnant, you're African American, Hispanic, American, Latino, Native American, Asian American, or Pacific Islander, or if you're on any possible second generation antipsychotics. So think about all of those risk factors and try not to think about it just for yourself, but also how many individuals on your caseload may be at risk? How many have diabetes? Really think about who you're working with. How, of the people who are at risk, how many of those people are on medications that contribute to weight gain and might be a concern for them? So strategy three is supporting health behavior change. Chronic diseases that require support with self-management are the reason why our skills in supporting health behavior change are so important. As case managers or care managers, you are already skilled at this because you help people with complex behavioral health issues live successfully in the community. Now you're extending those skills to help people manage their chronic illnesses. And I believe it, there's been past webinars um, or trainings that you've had that talk about determinants of health. But if we take a second to really look at this, um, this pie chart here from the World Health Organization, you can see that access to healthcare counts for only 10% of what drives how healthy we are or not. Whereas 51% of the determinants of health are really attributed to lifestyle which thankfully is the thing that we can really help people with and, and you all can really connect with the people you serve to fo focus on their smoking, obesity, stress, nutrition, blood pressure, alcohol, drug use. And how do you help? So developing strong motivational interviewing skills is important, building hopeful compassion, use of your own internal team and i would think to extend that to also understanding resources and in your external referral system and increasing your own health literacy so include information for your own knowledge so that you can help the people you serve understand about physical illness nutrition and exercise So I like this, um, and I don't know if it's cut off on your screen. So this says, sometimes it's good to change your walking routine. Try walking around the block instead of wandering around the kitchen. So it's just a little joke or, or comic that I like to, to show in regards to talking about developing a change plan, which is something that you can do to help the people you serve. A change plan is all about changing habits. So if you think about the slide before for the determinants of health and all of those lifestyle determinants, we really want to work with the people we serve to create change plans that help address those habits. And so it's good to start with a small change plan, so short, direct, and immediate goals that people can do right away. So an example of that might be to go for a walk for, you know, if, if, if they want to improve their overall exercise or perhaps work on their obesity, you know, and if you're doing something short and small, right, you'd go for a walk maybe for five to 10 minutes, not for an hour, or you would encourage somebody to walk around the block, not walk for miles or, you know, run a marathon suddenly. 
We know um, also that people who are most likely to act on a goal or change and to do so successfully when they act on it should do so within the first 24 to 48 hours. People are more likely to be successful, more likely to actually follow through with their change plan and their short goals when, within the first 24 to 48 hours. So really encourage people to do something right away. You know, and we do help people and we work within their limits or constrictions, but it, in general, I do try to have somebody create some uh, plan, a small goal that they can do right away and, ex and explain to them just, just that, that, that you want them to be successful in it. And we want to make clear plans that so when they leave from seeing you, they can go out and be able to do that right away. So on this slide, these are some of the things that you can ask or prompt people um, when helping somebody to make a short-term change plan. So, you know, you can ask one way, one way that you can improve your health is what? Or um, something that somebody can say to them is when I, when I will start, what will I do? How often will I do it? And then I think this is very important and sometimes we don't spend enough time working with people to explore what might get in the way of, of being able to do this goal, to do, to do this small change plan. How can I address it? So really talk through the barriers. Um, explore at what time, how often, what amount, um, you know, kind of help somebody talk through. And I use actually role play a lot in this, this area to really give somebody an opportunity to try out and test what, what they're going to do. If it's having a conversation with somebody or, um, you know, having, being able to practice some skills with you helps them to be successful when they leave. And make sure to follow it through on checking in, um, whether us it's at the next visit or by phone. So you definitely want to ask, you know, when will we check in about this? Um, and, and really be able to help the person you're serving to follow through and see if they've done it. And make sure with that check-in, um, sometimes we feel like it can go without saying, but I think it is sometimes important to say to somebody that you, you're just here to help them and to figure out how they can be successful. So if they don't follow through or they have a struggle with, with the change plan that they've created, you know, it's not about letting you down or anything for you as, as the person working with them, but it's really just about how you can help them to be successful for the next time, even if they feel like they weren't successful that time. So again, talking through barriers that got in the way um, and helping them to, to plan for the next time. And you can, when, when creating the change plan, you know, asking how important is it for you to make this improvement also helps people, and this is sort of with the motivational interviewing aspect of figuring out for them their importance level of this, of this change plan for, for this lifestyle behavior change. You know, how confident are you in taking action to make an improvement? Again, will help you to gauge with them and you can, and, and one, technique, and certainly if you're learning motivational interviewing, you can learn more about this, but, you know, one technique is if somebody says, well, you know, I'm not very confident, I'm, I would rate it a three. You know, you might then say, well, you rated it a three, that's great. What made you not rate it a two? You thought it was at least three, so let's talk about why it's a three and not a two, um, and really sh helping them to shift the way that they think about change. So remember that it is about constant learning, constant change, and bravely stepping forward into the new, the next new knowledge. Um, we are always learning and science is always advancing, right? The only thing that says is constant is change. So I really encourage you to embrace change and embrace this and to be lifelong learners. So thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate your time. And so what I'd like to do now is just turn it over to Edie to see if there are any questions or comments in, in the question box.
Thank you. Thank you, Laura. That was terrific. There are a few questions in the question box, but before we uh, get to it, I want to remind people to, um, we have uh, plenty of time for questions, and so type your questions in the question box now, and I will get to them. And also, just for you to know, there is a download pod here where you can get the slides, and also this is being recorded, and you'll be able to, if you came in late, you can catch the beginning of it on the recorded link. So, Laura, I wanted you to maybe go back for a minute on the development of a concrete short-term change plan. I mean, we know from our work that change is difficult for people and that sometimes um, when, um, when you don't, when you're not yet ready for change, we can help people sort of develop their readiness to change. So do you have any comments on how we can work with someone who kind of answers these questions? Um, you know, I don't really want to improve my health or I don't think there's anything wrong with my health or, um, you know, I, I don't, there's too many people in my way, I can't address it. You know, how do we deal with those who really feel very, sort of helpless and hopeless about change? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question and, and something we certainly do see. You know, I think it's it's helpful um, to understand what motivates motivates people and to really talk with them about if, if they're not seeing a problem, but you know they have chronic illness and maybe you've had heard information from a primary care provider about some struggles that person has had, you know, it's, it's helpful to just have a conversation um, with somebody around why, why either they're, they're feeling hopeless um, or why they don't feel like it's a problem. And, you know, we don't want to be confrontational, you know, about it and say, well, your primary care provider said you had, had a problem, you know, but it's important to explore some of the areas in conversation and discuss it, discussion. Um, about maybe what the primary care provider might have alerted you to or what you might know. And so sometimes what I'll start with people um, is really about sharing some things that I know about uh, their chronic illness. So perhaps, um, and, and not in talking in terms of about that person individually, but about in general. So I might say something like, you know, one thing that I know about diabetes, and I just, I, I wanted to talk with you about um, some sort of common common areas that people might struggle with. Um, one thing that I know is that people um, have trouble uh, walking or um, they start to get really thirsty and they get up several times throughout the night to, to go to the bathroom um, and then so then they feel like they have trouble sleeping. And I'm just curious if, you know, how you're sleeping and how you're managing you know, to really start a conversation. And that conversation over time and as you develop rapport and engagement with that patient, with that person that you're serving, you know, that those kinds of that information expands and and they evolve. Um, and the other important piece when, when you're working with somebody who feels like maybe they have low confidence in taking action is to help them remember that they're not alone that they they are part of the team um and it is so important you know go kind of going back to the health literacy aspect of not only for you to understand about um the their illness but to help patients understand and understand language that's so that healthcare can be transparent and clear to the person and so that it's the person doesn't feel like it's happening to them, but that they're a part of it, and that they can really be a driver in in the car of their healthcare. So, again, spending time together, talking through, researching, um, you know, pulling up if you have access to a computer and being able to pull things up or on a smartphone together um, can really help. And just continuing the conversation can help get somebody to a point where then they start to consider making a change for themselves and, and reminding them that you're there to help and to coach and to problem solve along the way to really provide that support. Great. Thank you very much. Um, great answer. So here are some questions from our audience. What are some examples of what it means to not have high blood pressure under control? 
Um, so if I am understanding the question correctly, like what happens in the body when when you have uncontrolled high blood pressure? Um, I it think definitely that's, pulls, oh, oh. that's what it is. Sorry, go ahead. Okay, great. Um, you know, I think what, you know, one of the things is really it puts a strain on the heart. Um, people will end up having uh, some, some different heart conditions. They could die of a heart attack as an unfortunate example. Um, you know, they can, the, the muscle, basically with the muscle gets tired over time, right? And so things stop, stop working properly. And, and when, when the blood is not pumping properly in our body, uh, the, our organs and how our body reacts doesn't function properly. So things stop working or blood doesn't get to the places properly that it needs to get to or blood, blood vessels break down. So there's a lot of different, different problems that can occur. And, you know, I, as I field this question and as a social worker myself, you know, I think it's important to remind you all that we need to know about these things, but we don't need to know everything or be able to even answer this question, right? So if I couldn't answer this question as somebody on the team, I would say, you know, that's a really good question. And I want to get you the answer for that. And I'm going to circle to one of my team members to talk with them so I can really help you to understand if you were the client I'm serving, um, to understand really what that means if you have hypertension or if you know, the blood isn't pumping properly through the body. So it's the same thing, like do not feel like you have to be an expert or have all the answers, uh, but to be able to na help someone navigate how to get those answers. You know, that was a great point, Laura, because as you were talking, I was thinking, I'm also a social worker, and I was thinking that in our new world where we need to know so much about medical issues, we don't need to know all the details. We just need to know who to ask. And um, high blood pressure affects different people in different ways. So this would be a wonderful opportunity to work with that individual client and their medical practitioner or a medical person or nurse uh, to find out how the high blood pressure is going to affect their particular situation. And um, and I love your answer, Laura. We just need the same as the client needs to navigate. We just need to help people navigate that medical system. Because I think it's very daunting when we think we have to take on a whole new level of info. I know it would be for me. And um, and I, oh, I don't think sure. we need to I agree. And, you know, and again, I want to draw attention. I, I didn't kind of go there in the slide deck, so I'll go there now. But you know, there's a resource page, and this, <laughs> this is by no means an exhaustive list, and, um, but there are a lot of great resources out there um, that are from reputable sources, journals, and different um, uh, associations that really can help you to not only with your own team members get information, but also through these resources to help get information. And I, I I really encourage you to, with the people you serve, to again pull up. If you're in the community, pull up a smartphone and look some stuff up with them. And to help as you navigate, you can show and role model that navigation of how you find the answers. And, and not only with talking to to that person's providers and team members, but you know how they would how they would manage it in other ways and resources that exist for them. Great. So, you know, you have the slide deck here attached, so you can pull it down, everyone, and then um, and then access these resources easily. You don't have to furiously write on the screen now. Um, so, Laura, here's another question. How do we help those who have hypertension due to a medication, but that medication is needed to control other diagnoses that the person has? Yes, um, and that does happen a lot. And so one way that you can help is to um, it's really partner with that person's prescriber. So if it's you know a psychiatry provider or if it's a primary care provider, um, whether it's over the phone or in person, um, being able to have a, a conversation with that that patient to to talk through their options and also to understand 
the pros and cons to being on the medication versus off or being put on something else or maybe the dosage changes. And so it's about talking through that communication and, and connecting the person you serve with the resources to, to really explore that and to have that conversation. Um, you know, I, I'll often talk about side effects and that there's pluses and minuses like anything in life. Like there are things that we know that help us, but also are frustrating. And, you know, I'll draw our attention to, for myself, I'll, you know, I'll often talk about exercise. Like when I exercise, I'm tired. I don't like to feel sweaty, but I know that it's good for my body. And after I'm done, I feel good. And so I weigh out the pros and cons of, of whether or not to exercise and to really understand whether I want to do that or not for, for my body. And is the, do the pros, do the positives really outweigh the negatives? So that's one way to talk about it. But I really encourage people to have a team conversation um, together. So yourself with the person you serve and then with their provider to really talk through that and just to see what other options might exist for them. Sometimes those, those conversations don't always happen with with the people that we serve in the office. You know, they some sometimes they're too timid or they don't advocate or they just don't ask questions or or maybe the right questions at that time for themselves. And so they don't know about other options. And so one of one of our jobs is to really help connect them and to and to help advocate for them and then with them to to role model that so you know that we're not just doing it for them, but we're really coaching them through that process. Terrific. Um, so if anyone else, that's it for the questions I have right now. If anyone else has a question, do type it in now before we go. Um, Laura, do you, um, do you have anything else that you want to share with folks? Um, just that, to you know, my, so my email is on the screen and I do really want to encourage you all to reach out to me if you have any further questions or need any clarification on anything that I brought up in today's webinar, please do reach out to me at Laura L at the national council .org. Um, And, you know, I, I think it, it is about this quote here, you know, we, we want to be lifelong learners. Um, and I know for myself working in healthcare, for, you know, very recently for 12 and a half years before I was at the national council, you know, sometimes it just seems like it's whipping by and we do so much and add so much more on to what we're already doing that it can really seem like a struggle or frustrating to kind of catch up with everything but it's okay and it's important to just sit back and reflect and know that you just gonna have to give yourself time and patience in that process you know, it is something that with healthcare, things things are always ever changing, and and we grow and we're ever learning. And so, just to encourage to be patient with yourself, but to encourage yourself to to use your own resources through that process with your supervisors, with your team members, um, with your peers to really help you through that process. I think you know it's it's about how we can help the people we serve and to help ourselves to be able to do that in the best way we can. Well said. Um, can you give me the next slide, um, Laura, please? Uh, next. Sure. Okay. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank um, you all for attending today and also to thank um, Laura Leone from the National Council for a really terrific presentation. We're, um, again, lucky to have such terrific partners in this project. So, um, and we do it, we, we do it together the same way we're asking, um, we're being asked of all of us to have interdisciplinary teams. You know, we have partners with diverse skills and putting those skills together um, is a way that we're finding to be able to offer you this information. So we hope it's helpful. And again, thanks so much to you, Laura, for a terrific presentation. I want to remind folks about what's next. Um, we are not done yet. <laughs> um, so we will be having, I think you've seen some of our knowledge builders. They're short videos produced by the Center for Practice Innovation, and they are pre-recorded. Um, and so they, they, what we call drop live, and then you can view them. So tomorrow, June 1st, is tomorrow, June 1st already? Wow. 
We're going to have two short videos drop, supervision that helps the supervisor and supervisee. So if you're a supervisor or you're not a supervisor, this is still a good video for you to watch. And then the second one, taking care of ourselves as we help others. I think self-care is something that's extremely important that none of us um, have mastered so well yet. So do, um, do watch after tomorrow these two short videos. We will be having our next live webinar in July. And Ruth is asking that you please watch the two short videos before the July live webinar. So you, you have the whole month of June to take a peek at them. And we would appreciate if you would look at them. Also, this is a great opportunity to go back and catch up on the webinars that you were unable to attend live. This, this webinar will be posted on the website in a few days as soon as our uh, wizard behind the, the scenes, Julie, gets it up there. Um, um, she's terrific at pulling these webinars together. So make sure you catch up on the other webinars that have gone on. Take a look at the short videos and do us a favor. Um, when we're done here, there'll be a quick evaluation form that's going to be emailed to you immediately following the webinar. We would love for you to fill that out for us. We are always trying to improve our training initiatives, and we do that by listening to what you have to say and then changing things based on that. So we have documented your attendance. Please remember that if you're watching as a group, list everyone's name on the evaluation form, and we can forward them the form as well. That way we know you've attended and we won't be um, following up with you um, over and over again about where the attendance is. So with that, I want to thank Laura Leone again from, uh, for the wonderful presentation today. Thanks so much, Laura. And, thank um, you. It's been Al, my pleasure. Yeah, and thanks to Julie for running such a smooth webinar, and thanks to all of you for spending a little bit of your morning with us. And uh, enjoy the new short videos, and we'll see you again in July. Have a good day.